Well, good morning, everybody in Asia and Australia. Good afternoon to participants in North America and good evening to our uh, friends in uh, Europe. Uh, this is the book launch for an exciting new book um, uh, written by Clive Hamilton and Marike Olberg entitled uh, Hidden Hand. And uh, I've read the book, uh, it's terrific. And I think today we will try and uh, convince you all to uh, purchase a copy. Uh, reasonably available in Canada with a discount, thanks to our sponsors, Optimum Publishers International. Um, first of all, I think uh, this event's being sponsored by the McDonald uh, Laurier Institute. My name is Charles Burton. I'm a senior fellow in the Institute's uh, Center for Advancing Canada's Interests Abroad. And uh, I think, first of all, we'd like to have a few words from the managing director of the McDonald Laurier Institute. Uh, Brian Lee Crowley. So if we could run the, the video, let's see what Mr. Crowley has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Brian Lee Crowley, Managing Director of the McDonald Laurier Institute. I'd like to welcome you to our special digital book launch of Clive Hamilton and Marika Olberg's new landmark study, Hidden Hand, exposing how the Chinese Communist Party is reshaping the world. MLI has been a leader in Canada in raising tough questions about the global ambitions of the Chinese regime and its increasingly authoritarian rule. Indeed, China's behavior throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, from its initial cover-up of the outbreak to its disinformation effort and cynical mass diplomacy throughout the world, has only reinforced the global concerns about the People's Republic and its Communist Party rulers. Yet we also cannot ignore the dangers posed by Chinese actions much closer to home. As described in past MLI publications and events, China has pursued sharp power influence operations against Canada and our allies. Sharp power is a broad term that incorporates unsavory methods such as co-optation, bribery, rewards, disinformation, censorship, and other means. Revelations of Chinese penetration in Australia, New Zealand, the Czech Republic, and elsewhere has become an increasingly frequent occurrence. Canada is certainly not immune. China's united front groups are known to be active in Canada, and we know the Chinese Communist Party has an ongoing campaign to embed agents of influence, shape public opinion in its favor, and in many instances, intimidate or harass Chinese Canadians and other critics of the regime. Yet despite mounting evidence, our federal government has time and time again shown itself unwilling and unable to recognize and confront the Chinese Communist Party's hidden hand in influencing and infiltrating Canadian politics, business, academia, and media. We all need to recognize the dangers of Chinese influence operations and ask ourselves how we can fight back and blunt this form of sharp power. With this in mind, I'm really delighted that MLI is hosting the digital book launch of Hidden Hand. This book's message has never been more timely or relevant to Canada and to the world. I hope you all enjoy what promises to be a very illuminating discussion. Well, thank you very much for that, Brian. Um, and now we'd like to have a few words from uh, Dean Baxendale, the president of Optimum Publishing International, who is the publisher of the Canadian edition of the book. Um, again, good morning, afternoon, and evening to all of our distinguished guests. If you signed up to be part of this historic Canadian launch of Hidden Hand, you have more than an idle curiosity in Canadian and international diplomacy as it relates to the safety and security of the liberal egalitarian order, and most importantly, the international rule of law. Those that follow China now realize that the CCP led by Xi and his predecessors were not seeking to conform to or to liberalize their approach to domestic or foreign policy, as was the predominant belief by world leaders, but up to about 2017-18. Some have naively believed China is a benevolent force for the betterment of humankind. This is not a narrative that is backed by any evidence presented by Marecki, Olberg, and Clive Hamilton today. I would like to thank a few 
people that have made today's event happen. First of all, I would like to thank both the McDonald Laurier Institute for agreeing to put together such a professional package for our viewers today. Also, Jacob Janda from Managing Director of the European Value Center for Security Policy, who is hosting the event in Europe. Uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob also uh, hosted the first live discussion with the authors about a month ago, and it's available for viewing on their site. I'd like to thank my good friend and Thorn in the CCP side for over 30 years, Senator Condonino, who engaged parliaments, parliamentarians in standing up for Tibetans and the Falun Gong commencing in the late 80s. I'd also like to thank him for being one of our sponsors today. I would also like to thank Anders Kaur, publisher of the journal Political Risk in London and New York, and Emily de la Bière of Horizon Advisory in Washington, DC, both who have provided me with a deeper insights into the military and geopolitical aspirations of the CCP. 2020 has naturally been an interesting year. Had it not been for COVID-19 and the CCP's actions, we may not have had an many, as many open minds as I believe we have here today. China has indeed provided an opportunity for parliamentarians throughout the world to re-examine, as Brian Lee Crowley mentioned, the sharp diplomacy practiced by China. There are indeed an existential threat to freedom, security, and democracy. With that in mind, I would also like to th thank a colleague and confident, Brian uh, Charles Burton, of course, who uh, wrote the forward for the Canadian version and fully understands the, the CCP. Uh, I have first worked with Charles to actually do the forward for Sam Co Cooper's book, Willful Blindness, How a Criminal Network of Narcos, Tycoons, and CCP Agents Infiltrated the West, which we're hoping to bring to market this fall. Uh, since that time, we've worked uh, closely together on this project, and he's been a tremendous asset to Optimum Publishing. There are countless journalists and academics that have forged a path on bringing this subject to the people of the world, and many were accused of promoting conspiracy or being racist. This book is not about China. It's about the actions of the CCP. Many who have read Hidden Hand believe it will become a primer the world over for anyone who really wants to understand the CCP and their undermining of our various democracies. I'd like to thank you, all of those who have purchased the book over the past two weeks. It's been, as you may know, a fairly expensive week from a legal perspective, and we would encourage as many of you as possible to buy the book today. With that in mind, we have, first, we have addressed the first lawfare suit in the UK, and Optimum is pleased to announce today uh, in front of this esteemed crowd that we will meet our publishing date of July 3rd. We hope to have it in bookstores across the country and we'll meet our July 1st date for the digital release of the book. We start shipping to retailers today and I will have a statement on my site later this evening. Thank you very much and enjoy this very special book launch. Charles? Well, uh, thank you very much, Dean. Um, now we'd like to move to uh, the authors of this book um, who will uh, give some introduction to what they've written and whet your appetite for the content by reading some uh, short selections from the text. Uh, first of all, my dear friend and colleague, Marika Olberg, who is a senior fellow in the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, she had previously worked in the Mercator Institute for China Studies, where she co-authored the landmark report, Authoritarian Advance Responding to China's Growing Political Influence in Europe. And she has been really a mainstay uh, of us in the community who are seeking to raise awareness of Chinese influence operations uh, throughout the world. And she is also uh, published in many uh, mass media uh, outlets, including the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, and uh, German newspaper. So uh, Marika, please uh, uh, give us an introduction and then we'll uh, play a tape of you reading part of the book. I think she's muted and my lip reading is not that good. Yeah, I can see she's muted. <laughs> and she speaks with great passion, I think. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, maybe we should uh, turn to Clive until Marika figures out uh, how to make the sound work on her uh, computer from Berlin. Uh, let me say a few words about Clive uh, by way of introduction. Uh, he is a professor of public ethics at Charles Sturt University in Canberra. He's held many visiting academic uh, positions, including at the University of Oxford, Sciences Po in Paris and Yale University. For 14 years, he was the executive director of the progressive think tank, the Australia in Institute. He has written a previous book, which I also uh, found very influential on my thinking, entitled uh, Silent Invasion, about China's influence in Australia. Uh, this was the focus of public debate when publishing companies decided to reject it for fear of retribution from Beijing, but it was finally published by Hardy Grant Books in February 2018 and became an immediate bestseller. A Chinese language edition of Silent Invasion was published in Taiwan in 2019, and a Japanese edition published last month is a bestseller. He is the author of 12 books, and his opinions are widely read around the world in the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, Scientific American, The Guardian, and Canadian newspapers. Uh, Clive, please. Many thanks, Charles, and thanks to the McDonald Laurier Institute for putting on this event and bringing us together from around the world. I guess a, a kind of obvious place to start is um, why did we write this book? And it was actually suggested to me by my Australian publisher, Hardy Grant, after Silent Invasion came out, after it had um, an unexpectedly um, difficult birth and then a large impact, um, it, um, a bit like the um, China under the CCP, um, uh, they suggested that I should do a version for uh, a global audience, or the, in particular the West, that is North America and Europe. And so I asked uh, Marika if she would be willing uh, to co-author it and she uh, readily agreed. And so we got together to uh, research and, and write this book because we wanted to uh, uh, explain to people uh, across the Western world and, and indeed uh, beyond uh, that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is engaged in a uh, well-organized and systematic attempt to reshape the world order. Um, and we are aware that there is very widespread uh, ignorance and misunderstanding and naivety uh, about China under the CCP in Western countries. Um, a lot of attitudes were formed in the 80s and 90s, uh, particularly amongst elites, but also um, the media and the general public about China under the CCP, which now proved to be dangerously uh, wrong, as uh, Canada has found out uh, in the last year or so in, in a, a kind of dire way. And so what we did in the book is we collected together and presented uh, evidence of a comprehensive Chinese Communist Party influence and interference campaign in Western countries. And we give a lot of detail in the book about uh, CCP influence operations in the United States and in Canada and in four or five uh, major European uh, countries, including, of course, the United Kingdom and Germany. They, the book, incidentally, was published in Germany uh, at the beginning of May, and pleased to say it was uh, an immediate uh, bestseller. Germany was kind of waiting for this book, it turned out. So this influence uh, and, uh, and interference campaign is uh, mostly covert. We see a lot in the press about wolf warrior diplomacy and uh, threats and bullying and so on, but what is missed and which we detail and explain is the covert operations of the CCP aimed at undermining democracy and human rights. Um, that's in addition to their, of course, overt attempts. But the covert attempts are generally not recognized for what they are or misunderstood when they are seen. So we really wanted um, to make uh, a very strong point that uh, the CCP is engaged in political warfare against uh, the West. This is not us declaring it so. This is how the CCP sees it. And this is how CCP theorists and leaders talk in China about their relationships with the West. So we hope that our book uh, will uh, help people uh, in democracies. And when I say people, I mean all kinds of people, including people of Chinese heritage, uh, 
uh, who live in democracies to understand exactly how the CCP is operating and what a great threat it is, the great threat of the era to democracy and human rights. Well, those are powerful words. Um, I think if Marika is still uh, uh, muted, uh, we could go to the uh, to Clive's video. I think I uh, maybe can you hear me now? Ah, okay. So please uh, say a few yes. words, and we'll show your video, and then we'll show Clive's video. Great. Um, should I still say a couple of words? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna, um, sorry, I was saying uh, someone needs to unmute me earlier because I couldn't figure it out, um, uh, having some technical difficulties. But basically, um, so the, the basic idea of, of our book, and Clive has already talked quite a bit about the background on why we think this is important. But I mean, our, our central thesis really is that the, the um, basic underlying um, thinking of how we've been approaching China has simply been wrong. We've been having this line, our governments have had this line that if only we engage China economically, if only we keep doing trade with China, then China will automatically, as it gets richer, will start opening up. Citizens will start demanding demanding political rights, will start demanding democracy, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of how this has worked with the former Soviet Union and with a number of other countries. So this was the basic assumption. Now, one could always say that this, this line has always been a little disingenuous and that it was mainly a pretext to allow Western businesses to engage and trade with China and to profit off of that. But regardless, I think by now it's been disproven as wrong. And the, our main mistake um, in why this has not worked out and why it could have never worked out was that we have simply disregarded one of the main actors in the equation, namely the Chinese Communist Party, which has studied precisely how this went down in the Soviet Union, how it went down in the Eastern Bloc, um, and has put in place things to prevent precisely this happening in China. This was first mainly aimed at domestic audiences, how do you build up your censorship walls? How do you make sure that certain ideas don't come to China and aren't listened to by Chinese audiences? But in the long run, the Chinese Communist Party has decided for long-term regime stability and regime security, it's not enough to keep certain ideas out of China, but it needs to change how the world thinks and how the world is aligned. And this is basically the background of our book this idea that in order for the Chinese Communist Party to stay in, in, in power in the long run, conceptually, people have to start thinking differently about it. Basically, it's not enough if the CCP says we're the best system for China, but foreigners have to actually start believing it. So that creates a feedback loop back into China. Same for anything that the Chinese Communist Party considers sensitive. It's not enough if nobody speaks about Tiananmen, if nobody speaks about um, the Uyghurs, if nobody speaks about Tibet in China, these have to become global taboos so that those news don't come back into China. Um, same for the way that the international sphere is organized. Um, this is viewed as being to the disadvantage of the Chinese government that you know the world is full of alliances that are usually US centric alliances, um, the, the alliance, the transatlantic alliance between the United States and Europe, um, alliances the United States has <clears throat> in the vicinity of China. So the idea is to slowly realign those alliances and to unify basically all other countries against the main enemy, which on a global scale is the United States. Um, and to first achieve this by um, basically tying countries up in alternative systems and in alternative informal alliances. One of the major ones that are important, that is really important here is the Belt and Road Initiative, which is basically meant to increase the dependence of countries and loyalty of countries towards China. So that when there is a conflict between China and another country, those countries will first stay neutral and eventually, as this project progresses, they will start actually aligning themselves more with China and take China's side. Now, this is a long-term project. We're right in the middle of it. Um, I think if you're based in Canada, you will have seen a lot of, not just in Europe, a lot has been the constructive side of China reaching out and saying, we just want to be friends, the Chinese government reaching out. I think Canada has actually seen a lot more 
of the aggressive side of the Chinese government that um, we in Europe, where I'm based, are only beginning to see. Um, but it has those both both sides, the constructive side <clears throat> and the aggressive side, the wolf warrior diplomats and the actual curtailing um, of countries that are not considered as in line with Chinese interests. Now, I don't want to talk too long. Um, I'm going to stop here, um, but I very much look forward to discussing um, more of this with everybody um, in the Q&A part of this webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Marika. And, and I would say that, um, you know, next to the YouTube video, there is a, a, a chat box where you can enter questions and we will have a question and answer period uh, very shortly once we've looked at a couple of videos of, of uh, readings from the text. So perhaps we could show uh, Marika's video first and uh, then we'll say a few words and move on to Clive's. The Chinese Communist Party is determined to transform the international order, to shape the world in its own image without a shot being fired. Rather than challenging from the outside, it has been eroding resistance to it from within by winning supporters, silencing critics, and subverting institutions. As analysts on both sides of the Atlantic continue to agonize over whether to label China an opponent or even an enemy, the CCP decided this matter 30 years ago. In the post-Soviet world, it saw itself surrounded by enemies that it needed to defeat or neutralize. While the CCP and its supporters in the West like to speak of a new Cold War being waged against China, the party itself has all along been engaged in an ideological struggle against what it thinks of as hostile forces. For the CCP, the Cold War never ended. The reshaping of alliances and the remolding of the way the world thinks are essential to the party securing continued rule at home as well as to its reach abroad and eventually making China the number one global power. The party's plans have been explained at length in speeches and documents. Its implementation strategy is to target elites in the West so that they either welcome China's dominance or accede to its inevitability, rendering resistance futile. In some nations, mobilizing the wealth and political influence of the Chinese diaspora, while at the same time silencing critics within it, is central to the strategy. Backed by its enormous economic clout, China engages in arm-twisting, diplomatic pressure, united front and friendship work, and the manipulation of media, think tanks, and universities. All these tactics overlap and reinforce each other. Some people claim that Beijing's influence around the world is no different to that of any other country. While not everything the party does is unique, the scope, degree of organization, and eagerness to use coercion distinguish the CCP's actions from other nations' diplomatic activities. As the world's largest factory and second biggest economy, China has been a magnet for Western businesses and many Western politicians. Some industries are heavily dependent on access to China's huge market, and Beijing is willing to use this dependence as a political weapon. In the words of one close observer, if you don't do what Beijing's political leaders want, they will punish you economically. They put the economic vice on politicians around the world. They have been doing it for years, and it works. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for that, um, Marika, and it, it really gives us a taste of uh, what's in the text. I think next we have um, uh, Clive reading from the book, uh, a section of the book that I think will be of particular interest to the Canadian viewers here today. When Huawei's chief financial officer, Meng Wanzhou, was arrested in Canada in December 2018 on an extradition request from the United States, she was accused of bank fraud, among other things. At the height of the angry diplomatic fight that ensued, Canada's ambassador to China, John McCallum, gave a press conference to Chinese language media in Ontario in which he offered advice to Meng as to how she could mount the best legal defence against extradition. McCallum, already well known as a friend of China, he'd recently said that Canada has more in common with China than with the United States, listed what he saw as serious flaws in the extradition case. Some suggested the ambassador sounded as if he were speaking for the government of China rather than defending Canada's position. A few days later, McCallum followed up his advice to Meng on how to fight her extradition 
by saying it would be good for Canada to release her, thereby privileging the pacification of Beijing over Canada's legal obligations to the United States. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was forced to sack him, leaving observers to puzzle over how such an experienced politician and diplomat could misfire so badly. One who recognised why McCallum was saying the things he did in support of Meng was former Mexican ambassador to Beijing, Jorge Guajardo. He'd been groomed in the same way. Envoys new to Beijing are isolated from senior Chinese officials. After a time, a message is sent that a high-ranking official wishes to meet them. They meet and they're told they have a unique understanding of the nuance and delicacy of the party's position. They begin to see themselves as special. They're granted rare access to top leaders and believe they have been entrusted with an unusual insight into the inner workings of Chinese politics. Of course, other envoys are being groomed to believe the same. As special friends of China, the envoy's advice to their masters back home reflects their unique insight and is exactly the advice Beijing wants them to communicate. Self-belief coupled with the need to feel important opens people to seduction. The CCP's expert manipulation of vanity was identified by a previous Canadian ambassador to China, David Mulroney. He wrote, You and you alone are sufficiently gifted and experienced to understand the situation and explain it to your government. The fate of the bilateral relationship is in your hands. Far more so than with any other country, diplomats in China become convinced that the most important thing in the world is maintaining good relations. They are persuaded that China is difficult for foreigners to understand, and instead of explaining their country's viewpoint to China, ambassadors see their role as explaining China's position to their governments, and so they become a conduit for the CCP's messaging. That was McCallum's mistake. Well, thank you very much for that, Clive. Uh, now I think we'll turn to a few questions. I, I, I'll take my prerogative as moderator to ask a couple and then we can move on to the uh, questions from the audience. And I would encourage uh, anybody watching on YouTube to send in your questions and we'll try and get to as many as we can uh, before uh, 5.15 uh, Eastern Daylight Time. So uh, my first question I think I should uh, go to uh, Clive as he's spoken on this before. And I wonder, Clive, if you could talk about um, the biggest and most significant examples of CCP influence and interference in Canada. Um, is Canada somehow more vulnerable than other countries to China's sharp power operations? Canada is, uh, as I think any kind of mildly switched on observer can see, particularly uh, vulnerable to CCP influence operations, as indeed uh, has Australia been. And I think that's uh, because of the, uh, uh, partly because of the uh, close economic dependence that's uh, developed over the years. But really, that kind of close independence is always uh, matched on the other side by a great deal of work which the CCP and various people uh, operating on behalf of the CCP do uh, on the elites within other countries. And when we look at uh, what's happened in Canada, which we, we do in some detail in the book because it's such an interesting and important and revelatory case, we can see a process going back some uh, 30 plus years whereby once uh, Canada, sorry, China was uh, kind of opened up and Canada played a significant uh, global role in doing that, there was this gradual process of uh, Canada's business and political elites uh, forming a deep uh, set of entanglements, financial, political and uh, personal friendship um, with top Communist Party officials. And that uh, deep network of influence, uh, because after all, it was really a way in which the CCP was systematically setting out to build these relationships as a way of uh, exerting political influence has had really, I'd say, a crippling effect on Canada's understanding and re uh, response to uh, China uh, in recent years. And of course, nothing illustrates that more than the way in which the Trudeau government has been like the proverbial deer in the headlights, 
in response to Beijing's uh, uh, scandalous behavior in reaction to the arrest of Meng Wanzhou. I mean, it's the brutality of uh, Beijing's uh, reaction, uh, including the, the arrest of the, the two Michaels, has really been so far beyond any kind of normal diplomatic protocols that um, you know it ought to uh, receive global condemnation uh, uh, as, as indeed it has. But the Trudeau government has been immobilized. And some people wonder why uh, the Trudeau government has been so immobilized, in, in contrast, for example, to the Australian government, which has been much firmer and clearer in drawing lines and sticking to them. And I think it's because if you look at uh, senior people within the Trudeau government, including the Prime Minister himself, they are so entangled mentally, as well as uh, in other ways, in a certain perception of China that has been cultivated by the CCP and its agencies over many years, uh, including, of course, um, the Prime Minister's father, uh, Pierre Trudeau, that it, it, it would take such a, a kind of mental uh, transformation for the Prime Minister to adopt a, a firm stance defending Canada's uh, interests that, that he simply can't do it. And uh, that is why the government of Canada uh, and the attitudes of the people of Canada rapidly changing over the last year have turned into a gulf. And it's been uh, fascinating, if uh, disturbing, to watch from a distance. If I, if I could just follow up with you on that, Clive. Um, you know, given the turning tide of Canadian public opinion on China, you know, we've got uh, recent uh, polls here in Canada that suggest 80% of the population feels that the government is not managing the relationship properly. Why is it that our politicians are still so reticent to push back against Beijing? What, what's the mechanism there? Well, part of the answer, I think, lies in the, uh, the uh, extract uh, I read about John McCallum and this uh, set of beliefs uh, that has been developed uh, amongst elites that uh, uh, China under the CCP is very fragile, um, it's very aggressive, it's very hard to handle, and we must treat it with kid gloves. Because if we don't, you know, all hell will break loose and uh, it'll get out of control. And of course, that's exactly what Beijing wants you to think. And um, we talked about the, in the book, uh, and both Maraka and I have alluded to this already, the way in which uh, elites become convinced that um, there is some kind of secret to China, which they possess. And therefore, they in a, are in a better position to manage the relationship because they understand how the system works. And this perception has been carefully cultivated over years. And there's also this overlaid with this kind of, um, you know, notion that there's 5,000 years of Confucian history and there's a civilization clash, which is something we completely reject. And we point out that, no, China under the CCP is led by a government which is a Leninist party built on Leninist principles and that's how it should be treated uh, and understood. And I think that goes a long way to explaining why elites in Canada have so much difficulty grappling with the current situation. Oh, great. You know, that's very helpful to know. Um, if I could turn to Marika, uh, what do you think are examples of policies that countries like Canada can implement to combat China's United Front Work Department? Are there countries that have been um, more successful at stemming China's growing influence than uh, than Canada has? Um, I think so. I think part of this could actually be policies. Part of that could be laws. Could be um, I think the laws about more transparency around lobbying um, similar legislation to what's been passed in Australia or what exists in some form or another in the United States as well, that as a foreign principal or if you're working on behalf of a foreign principal, you have to register yourself. I think there's some usefulness to that. Um, but I honestly think the largest part around this is really about awareness and be getting a better understanding of 
how the Chinese Communist Party operates, um, getting better awareness of the fact that there is a lot of um, power and strength in numbers, like there are strength in numbers. Um, so raising awareness that as a single country, you're unlikely to be able to deal with China alone. So you really have to form alliances with other countries if you're going to push for or against something. Um, recent example, and this may not be the perfect example, but th this kind of illustrates that um, Australia asked for an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. Um, and China, the Chinese government, of course, was incredibly mad and started punishing Australia and uh, started um, economically pushing, punishing Australia. Um, then, of course, at the World Health Assembly, you had a bunch of countries getting together and demanding the same thing. That was like the United States, various European countries, of course, Australia as well, but also a number of developing countries. And faced with that united front, quote unquote, of countries, um, the Chinese government couldn't really do anything but actually sign on to this. Now, whether this is going to lead to a meaningful inquiry into the origin of COVID-19 is a different story. Um, but there really is extreme importance to making sure that you're working with other countries and to make sure that those countries can't be picked off one by one um, and to form alliances in order to counter precisely this united front principle of trying to align against single countries, singling out individual countries and making an example of them. And other countries are basically standing back and instead of thinking, oh, next time this could be us their thinking is oh great it's not us so we don't have to worry so this yeah. this is something very fundamental that simply has to change could i just add to that please charles because obviously it's a, a topic uh, of intense interest here what's fascinating and what maraca says is absolutely correct but the there's a there's a kind of coda to this in and that is after the world health assembly unanimously voted uh, in favor of an inquiry um uh, 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 the, Beijing then started a program of punishing Australia. So, you know, there's this paradox of, okay, they lost that one, um, you know, it's going to happen. Uh, why continue to punish Australia? Australia cannot change its mind on the international inquiry because it's going to happen. But they did a whole program. They put uh, import restrictions on Australian barley, uh, on Australian beef. Uh, they started a, a media campaign in China uh, saying that Australia is an irredeemably racist country. It's a very dangerous place for Chinese people to visit. Uh, Chinese students and tourists will be well advised not to go there. Uh, and uh, they engaged in consist uh, persistent insults and bullying against the Australian government. And now we've seen an, uh, up, a serious upturn in cyber attacks against all kinds of institutions around Australia. So there's been a sustained attempt to punish Australia for uh, what, uh, what we did. And I think the message here is that uh, to other middle-sized uh, nations uh, around the world, and indeed small ones, that if you displease us, we're going to punish you. And the interesting thing is that the Morrison government, the Conservative government here, has been very, very interesting in its response because it said very calmly uh, but firmly that what is at stake here are Australia's essential values, uh, our independence as a nation and our belief in the uh, free information and understanding in particular what happened with the outbreak of COVID. These are our principles. This is what we believe in and we are not going to be bullied. And the prime minister and the foreign minister have said explicitly, we are not going to be bullied. And uh, quite frankly, I expect Beijing to continue to punish Australia in all kinds of ways. And we, are taking an economic hit, and we will take more of an economic hit, and we have to see how that plays out. I mean, if Australia buckles at the knees next month or in one year's time, this will be a huge setback to the Western world because it will reinforce <clears throat> Beijing's belief that bullying, threats, intimidation is the way to get its way in the international community. Well, I think that uh, if I could follow up on that and the last question before we move to the audience, and perhaps both of you could comment, but uh, let's have Clive speak first. You know, just yesterday, a group of 19 distinguished Canadians wrote up 
public letter to the Prime Minister urging that the Minister of Justice intervene in the um, extradition hearing for the Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou, which is uh, allowed for uh, under Section 23.3 uh, uh, of, of our Extradition Act, and uh, release her. And that, and that on the condition that the Chinese uh, government would agree to return uh, Michael Kovrick and Michael's favor to Canada and safety. And the basis for this um, really is uh, that the larger issue of, of our uh, conflict over Meng Wanzhou and, and Michael Kovrick and Michael's favor is that Canada is stuck in the middle of a great power conflict between the US and China. So there's a moral equivalence being established between two superpowers, and therefore Canada should just wash our hands of it um, and, uh, and uh, resolve the issue by uh, giving in to uh, what China wants. Um, do you think that this idea that Canada is stuck in the middle of, of uh, conflict between the US and, and China is an accurate characterization and, um, you know, do you think that, that this idea has any sort of purchase that, in fact, Canada should, uh, at this stage, 564 days uh, since Kovrick and Spavor were um, arbitrarily detained for no good reason whatsoever, uh, release Meng Wanzhou? Well, I mean, if uh, the government were to follow the advice of those Liberals, then um, every Canadian in China would immediately be in danger because the message is, to Beijing, if you want to get something from us, then arrest some of our citizens and we'll trade off um, whatever you want. I mean, it's such such a dangerous uh, proposition. I mean, look, if I were the wife of one of the Michaels, you know, I, I might make the same argument. But from a national point of view, uh, it really is a very, very dangerous thing uh, to recommend. So the idea of Canada being caught between two superpowers, I mean, that is a very dangerous way to think about it because Canadians need to decide what their values are. They need to decide uh, how strongly they uh, believe in them, uh, whether they're willing to uh, trade them off for economic or uh, other benefits. And I think this is something that, um, uh, yeah, in other words, how much do Canadians value democracy? How much do Canadians value human rights and responsible international behaviour? And if Canadians decide they don't value that very much, well, you know, play off the superpowers against each other, cosy up to a uh, totalitarian dictatorship um, and, and uh, you know, forget about it. But, you know, I don't think the bulk of Canadians, like the bulk of Australians, think that way. I mean, Canada, like Australia, has sent uh, their young and, 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 and bold, you know, people off over to various wars to defend those principles. Um, and so, you know, this is, and I, I should say that both Mariah and I are people who come, very much come from the left of the political spectrum. But uh, we recognise that the basic principles which people on the left actually share with conservatives, that is the principles of democratic uh, practice, of uh, defence of human rights, of uh, national sovereignty, they are shared amongst us and they are all under threat. And so I think ordinary people in Australia and Canada understand that. And one of the you know, silver linings, if you like, of this new threat to those essential principles is that people in democratic countries who have become complacent about the extraordinary rights that they enjoy um, are starting to understand that when they're under threat, they are in fact the most, uh, the most precious attributes of the nations in which we live and, and must be defended. Do you have any uh, further thoughts on that, Marika, about the superpower? Uh, Canada's just stuck um, in the middle of two superpowers and not to say uh, to hell with both of them? Absolutely. This is an argument that I'm really familiar with that's also often made in Europe. This is an argument that even parts of the German government seem to subscribe to where they say, well, we just feel like we're being forced to decide between in this clash between the superpowers and these superpowers um, are going to squash us and we, we reject to make a decision. And this moral equivalence between um, the United States and China. Now, as Clive said, we, we both come from the left. Neither of us 
loves the authoritarian tendencies and the problems in the United States. The problem here is um, what I like to tell people. And one, one thing, one, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is I actually want to reach out to my fellow people on the left and say, look, if you dislike the authoritarian tendencies that the United States government displays, you should be hating the Chinese Communist Party because the Chinese Communist Party is that on steroids. And the continued lumping in of both at the same level is really, um, it lacks nuance. You have to look at this. They're not the same. You can totally, you can, you can, one, one is not like the other. Um, and if you can't see that, you're not looking at it closely um, enough. And again, or you were, and I think this is mostly the case, you simply don't know enough about China, about the Chinese government. That is really the problem. We know we, we hear a lot in the media and every time, sometimes when something goes wrong in the United States about the protests, again, in terms of mass scale protests, um, you would never see that in China, of course, because it wouldn't be allowed to that extent. Um, so a lot of stuff simply goes missing. Um, and it's simply not not taken into account. And that is the one thing that I really want to change on on the discourse on on this, especially on the left. Now, honestly, on this proposal, um, on the two Michaels, I have to say one thing that I do applaud is that that letter basically basically says quite outright, quite acknowledges quite frankly that China, the Chinese government is engaging in hostage diplomacy. That's a good thing to acknowledge that and to say that out loud. That's actually a good thing. Um, I, I fully agree with Clive um, that if the Canadian government were to go with this, this would send a disastrous signal. So the only way that the Canadian government could go with this is to say, fine, we do it. We give in. But please, all Canadians now get out of China. Um, you're no longer safe. And if you stay, we can do nothing about it if something happens to you which would again be quite a drastic step and of course probably something they're not going to do um but that would be the only way that this would be in any way shape or form acceptable because it would send a very strong message that yeah fine we're doing this but this has consequence and this basically means our relationship is over well thank you very much for that uh, excellent response and i hope that people in the canadian government are are listening and taking notes uh, now we, I'd like to move to the uh, audience questions, and I will read them, and uh, perhaps the two of you can respond. The first question comes from um, the Honorable Condonino, who is a retired member of the Canadian Senate, and as Dean pointed out in his introduction, Mr. Uh, Danino got China early on and has been saying the kinds of things that uh, we've all been saying here today uh, long before it was uh, anywhere near the mainstream of opinion. Anyway, Khan's uh, question is, what are your thoughts on China's denial of widely reported human rights abuses? In many cases, these abuses are alleged to be large scale and systematically target racial, religious, and ethnic minorities perhaps most notably Tibetans and Uyghurs, but other persecuted groups as well. How can Canada and other countries push back against these abuses, given that China refuses to allow independent uh, verification? Would, would you like to take first crack at that, uh, Clive? Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for that question. It's a fascinating one. Let me just comment at a kind of theoretical level, if you like, and Barack can perhaps uh, develop this. But uh, the question said, well, um, how do we explain or understand uh, the denial of uh, the uh, abuses of human rights? And we need to understand that the Chinese Communist Party <clears throat> um, does not understand or treat what we think of as the truth or the evidence in the same way as we do. And it has an entirely instrumental uh, understanding and approach to the truth and the evidence. Um, and everything is either politically useful or not politically useful. And if it's politically useful to frame uh, events, incidents, uh, evidence in one way, then they'll do it uh, shamelessly. It's not as though they think, oh, we're going to lie here. Is that OK? It's just a pure, as a Leninist party, uh, it's, that's, that's how they operate. And as we talk a lot in the book about a discourse power or discourse control, 
And that is the way in which Beijing uh, devotes enormous attention and a great deal of very careful thought, including um, very clever uh, party theorists, that the attention and thought and the money that they put into shaping the narrative about events in China and the Chinese Communist Party. And of course, the most uh, stark instance of that in recent times is the way in which the party from the very early days of February this year decided that the whole narrative, the story about COVID-19 had got out of control and was dangerous. And so they wrote a different story about what happened uh, and they began to propagate it with every resource uh, at their disposal. It was about shaping the truth. It was about suppressing evidence in China and elsewhere that was inconvenient. Uh, and so I think the answer to the question comes down to a completely different understanding of what evidence and facts mean uh, to the CCP. Do you have anything to add to that, Marika? Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I fully agree. Truth is an instrumental thing in that regard. Um, truth is also... <laughs> Um, the, 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 the media distinguish between like um, the, the relative truth is like relatively true is this the full picture truth. Um, but one thing I want to add here, the, 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 the fact that the Chinese Communist Party wants international recognition and wants this legit legitimacy in the eyes of international publics really works to our favor in this regard. Because this means that actually pointing out these human rights um, um, violations is meaningful. And that if enough governments and enough activists and enough other groups around the world keep pointing this out, um, of course, the first reaction will be to, you know, hide more evidence and kind of switch things around a little bit. But Naming and shaming shows effect. This is shown over and over again. This is because, again, the Chinese Communist Party wants to look good in the eyes of the international public because it wants to look good in the eyes of its own public at home. Um, and this has an effect. So this really means pointed out the fact that the Chinese government doesn't allow um, independent inquiries. Of course, that's an obstacle to getting some of the material out. And this leaves some doubts in some cases, but by and large, in all these cases, we actually have enough information to make a very clear case that very severe human rights violations are taking place. In some cases, you can really collect this information off of public, public statements made by party, the party or in party media itself. Um, this is true for a lot of the programs that the party is running in Xinjiang against Uyghurs and other minorities there. A lot of this is actually publicly reported. Then on top of that, we've had some very substantial document leaks, which can also be used to really document this. So even though we can't get access to these camps, and if journalists are shown around, they're basically shown these Potemkin camps that look very different from the reality on the ground, we have enough information to understand what is happening and to make sure that our politicians, um, civil society, NGOs keep pushing because pushing and publicly naming and shaming works. And this is precisely what we should do. I'd just add, if I may, Charles, that yeah. tr truth has a habit of, of, of getting out. And uh, Marika mentioned the documents coming out of Xinjiang. And with the COVID thing, you know, there are plenty of, um, people in China who want the truth to be out. I mean, there are doctors there, there are uh, excellent scientists there, virologists and labs and so on, people who know the truth of what happened uh, or, or an important part of the truth of what happened. And they want the truth to be known. Um, and so if we are to get to the bottom of the COVID-19 outbreak, it will depend very much on whether there are some brave uh, souls in China, scientists, doctors, and so on, or bureaucrats with access to documents who decide that the world needs to know the truth and risk their lives, essentially, by leaking that information in the same way that uh, someone uh, within Xinjiang uh, leaked that vital information about the concentration camps there. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, we have a couple of questions about Hong Kong. As you may know, there are 300,000 Canadian citizens currently resident in Hong Kong and a larger community of 
of persons of Hong Kong origin uh, here in Canada. The first question is from Benedict Rogers, a uh, figure well known to many of us, the co-founder of Hong Kong Watch and advisor to the new Interparliamentary Alliance on China. And he asks, what are your views of the efforts by the Chinese Communist Party regime to silence criticism of the new national security law about to be imposed by Beijing on Hong Kong and the pressure on some multinationals, particularly banks, to force them to support the security law. Could you also comment on the role of CCP cells in these banks in Hong Kong? And uh, just uh, a second part of the question asked by uh, Gloria Fung, who is a, a leader in the Hong Kong community in the Toronto area. She asks, uh, what concrete actions could the international community take to support Hong Kong, which is ground zero against Chinese totalitarianism. Would you like to start with that one, Marika? Um, sure, let me start with that one. And first off, maybe let me say, I'm not entirely sure what the situation with party cells is in these particular banks in Hong Kong. I would also have to look that up to see what the status of that is. But this, this whole idea that you need to get everybody that you could possibly get to affirm that you are doing the right thing. This is really absolute, it's an absolute classic of how the Chinese Communist Party operates. It's kind of, it's, it's expected of these actors, be they political actors that are part of the regime, be they um, companies that depend on access to basically express allegiance or to Biao Tai, to express their political stance on this in favor of the Chinese Communist Party. This is something we also cover in our book. So it's really a classic to get these companies to do this. And it's really quite sad that these companies went along with it. Um, <clears throat> but it, it again shows that they are obviously desperate. They want to preserve the access to the city for as long as they can. Although I think they're essentially they're wrong to do this because this national security law is going to change. It's going to change the the way that Hong Kong functions. It's going to take away a quite substantial part of the judicial independence that is necessary for Hong Kong to remain the international financial center that it is. Because in order to have all these transactions, you really need trust in the legal system, and the national security law that the CCP has proposed and is now pushing through is going to take that away. So this is really a very short term calculation on the part of those beings. Now, what actions can governments take? Um, it would be, I'm not terribly optimistic that this is going to happen, but I do think if, all, if the Five Eyes countries and Europe and maybe Japan and a number of other countries really did get together and say, would say that one country, two systems is not a one-way street. This is not a status unilaterally conferred on, on Hong Kong by the Chinese Communist Party. This is a status that is also enshrined by multiple treaties that we may have made separately with Hong Kong. And if we find that they are no longer, Hong Kong status is no longer guaranteed, we cannot guarantee these treaties anymore. Right now, only the United States is doing this. If more countries really got together and did this, I think it would have an effect. Um, I'm not optimistic, but I do think if they got together, that would have quite an effect. Um, if they could credibly signal that, that they would really revisit their treaties. In the absence of that, and I'm currently incredibly pessimistic as far as Hong Kong status is concerned, I think the really the most important thing that countries around the world need to do is really introduce um, immigration schemes for Hong Kongers that want to leave the city. Um, I think the United, the, the United Kingdom should <clears throat> has a moral obligation to really take in Hong Kongers, but other than the United Kingdom, other countries need to follow suit. And they obviously can't just grant citizenship to Hong, Kong's, Hong Kongers, but they could create programs that would facilitate immigration for Hong Kongers that are not everybody will do this. A lot of people are not willing to leave their city. They want to keep fighting for it. But for those who have decided that they have no more chance to do this, there needs to be a way out. And that's the responsibility of basically every country um, 
and okay. looking uh, on to what's been happening. Anything you'd like to say, Clive? Uh, just a couple of points. It's a big and complex issue, obviously. One is that when we saw a bank like HSBC sign a uh, statement, you know, endorsing Beijing's takeover, in effect, you know, one reaction was, oh, this is terrible. Here's a Western bank uh, that should, you know, pursue proper principles and so on and so forth. But I think that's the wrong way to understand big corporations like HSBC. They have become entangled in the whole CCP elite network and the worldview of the CCP over many years. So it's actually not very much for them. Uh, they're not breaking any internal moral code. I mean, that's where they've been going for, for many, many years. It's just us looking on it saying, Oh, that's terrible what have they done well what they've done is follow through with the influence on the influence operation that they've been subject to for many years second point i'd make is that um as we explain in the book china under the ccp is is a party uh, party um party state uh, conglomerate and that means that the red aristocracy that uh, runs china um is enormously invested financially in many of the corporations that are based in Hong Kong. So a Magnitsky Act, uh, which penalizes those involved in human rights abuses in Hong Kong, really gets, you know, gets uh, at CCP officials where it hurts, and that's in their bank accounts. The third point I'd make is that um, uh, there is likely to be a mass exodus of people from Hong Kong. Um, regrettably, horribly, uh, people will have to leave their home because um, Beijing is not going to back off on this. Um, it's too important to the leadership. What that means is that there will be a, an exodus of um, hundreds and th of thousands and probably millions of people from Hong Kong who firmly believe in democratic principles and are escaping authoritarianism. Most of them will settle in Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, United States, particularly for uh, Canada and Australia. This could have a very, very important impact. I mean, I think we should welcome them with open arms because United Front work um, has been very, very intense within the diasporas in Canada and Australia. And there are segments within the diaspora, uh, the Chinese Canadian, Chinese Australian diaspora, who are essentially acting in the interests of Beijing, undermining democracy and sovereignty in uh, Canada and Australia. If we see a great influx of people of Chinese heritage from Hong Kong who believe in democracy and protection of human rights, uh, this will shift the political balance within the diaspora. It'll make it a lot harder for United Front activity to be carried out because those people from Hong Kong, seasoned political activists who, who have moved because they want to live free lives, they will make it hard for United Front activists in Canada, in Australia. And I think that will be, um, apart from the tragedy of millions of people having to leave their homes, it will strengthen, it will defend uh, our commitment to democratic practice uh, in Canada and Australia and prevent, uh, help to prevent it being undermined by the CCP. That's great. Uh, we have a question here from Greg. I'm sorry, I don't have Greg's other name. And he talks about um, the CCP's use of moral relativism in countering Western critiques. And so Greg says, for example, they will criticize Canada's legacy of colonialism and use that as a way to say that Canada has no right to criticize China. And I would add that, you know, the, the Canadian um, residential schools and and history of, uh, of mistreatment of Canadian indigenous people is also used by China to suggest that we shouldn't be uh, criticizing um, China's treatment of ethnic minorities. So the question from Greg is, um, how can we combat this kind of narrative, which clearly has a lot of presence uh, in the current political atmosphere and debate in Western liberal countries? Um, Mareka, do you want to try that one first? Um, sure, I can, I can go ahead first. Um, so I, I, what I always say, when I hear these arguments, and I hear these arguments a lot as well in any regard is that I kind of love how the Chinese Communist Party admits that what it is basically engaging in is 
19th century style colonialism, genocide, and all these kinds of things that it is saying, because you did that, it is now our right to do that too. Um, what kind of attitude is that? Um, so first, I usually start out by pointing that out. Um, that just because um, countries behaved like that <clears throat> um, in the past, uh, why, why would you want to emulate something that has been rejected and condemned um, for, for quite a while now? Um, and why are you openly admitting that you want to copy a policy of genocide and that you think genocide is your right um, because you point to other examples in history? Um, that itself is in incredibly problematic. And usually once you point that out, um, there, there is a lot of backing off um, already. I, I do think it's, it's also quite simple to say, um, again, I am combating injustices in my own home country um, because obviously even though things have gotten a lot better, there are still issues of racism and of other institutional problems, at least where I live in Germany. Um, so I combat that. Um, China happens to be my profession. I am professionally engaged in the study of China. This is something that I'm invested in. This is something where I have a moral duty to point out the same things when I see them in China or when I see them happening in China on steroids. Um, so just like I would point that out when they happen in my own country, I point them out when they happen in my professional field. Um, and I mean, I think, again, any other person can make a similar argument on simply <laughs> the grounds of shared humanity. Why would you not point that out when you see it happening? It's kind of your moral duty as a fellow human being. Um, I don't know if Clive has anything to add to that, but that, that is basically my response that I usually get. Yeah, it's very much a... Uh, thanks, Marika. absolutely. And it's something that Marika and I, as people from the left, uh, are dealing with constantly. I was uh, having a discussion with some you know, um, pretty much ordinary people from the left uh, about uh, CCP. It was actually in Europe somewhere and it's um, increasingly totalitarian ways. And, and after I talked for five or ten minutes, one of them said, oh, but what about Australia's treatment of uh, refugees? And I thought, well, <laughs> you know, look, um, I'm perfectly ha happy to have a discussion about Australia's treatment of refu refugees uh, boat people in particular, which has been appalling. And I, as a person of the left, has been, you know, out there um, criticising Australian governments for doing it, but hey, we're talking about China and its activities. So let's not let's not be distracted by this rhetorical trick of whataboutism, and and yet the CCP is brilliant at it. I mean, the way in which the CCP has manipulated or shaped and mobilised left opinion, uh, particularly uh, the left's uh, anti-race historical anti-racism, and you know more power to it. Um, it's been really quite extraordinary. Um, one of the uh, ways in uh, which it's done it is to is to try to uh, use United Front activity in Australia, for example, to take over the and uh, kind of monopolise the telling of the history of uh, Chinese heritage people in Australia. You know, which is a long and um, fascinating and important history and of course Chinese people have been arriving in Australia since the 1840s and making an extremely important contribution to cultural the cultural richness of the country but what we're seeing is CCP aligned people um, around Australia trying to capture that history uh, for example uh, in Chinese museums uh, uh, for example rewriting stories about the contribution of Chinese Australian diggers to Australia's war effort and subtly shifting it in a way that supports the uh, CCP-style nationalism and the and the greatness of China under the CCP. So it's something that really needs actually a lot more study. We talk a bit about it, uh, for example, in the book about the way in which the CCP uh, 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 intensifies uh, anti-Japanese feeling um, by uh, 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 encouraging and sometimes funding the um, uh, creation of monuments uh, to the exploitation of comfort women, sex slaves during the war. And so we have to be extremely careful about this. We have to recognise and react to 
racism uh, in our own societies, but we must not uh, be, allow ourselves to be drawn into a CCP program of promoting the party and, a, and its particular form of Chinese nationalism. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. Um, if there are uh, members of the media who have uh, questions for Marika or for Clive or for uh, Dean Baxendale about this book, um, they should reach out to Dean at Optimum Publishing. And um, if, if uh, you, anyone wants to set up media interviews uh, with the authors or the publisher, um, they can contact Dean and uh, he'll see what he can do about that. Um, now we'd like to turn to the um, closing uh, statements. Uh, uh, maybe Marika, you'd like to say a few words of uh, key takeaways from our discussion this afternoon. Sure. Um, I mean, I think my, my key takeaway from all of this, as we have seen, there are a lot of basically right now, um, the world is churning out new developments that basically make the points that we also make in our book on an almost daily basis. We have developments in Hong Kong, we have developments in Taiwan, we have developments in Canada, we have developments all over Europe, where the points that we want to make in the book and that we're trying to make are basically illustrated for us. Now, Clive and I did not choose it that way. We also did not choose to release it during the times of COVID-19. Um, but the fact that I feel right now are really is really a time when people not only read the book, but actually read the book and take in the examples from the book and then look at their surroundings, look at the news and see constant examples. Um, of the things that we describe playing out in real time. Um, as bad as it is that all of this is happening, I do hope that this is going to give us some momentum basically for countries, for Canada, for other countries to get us act together and to finally understand what is going on and to finally push back in a more concerted, more coordinated, and more decisive manner. Um, I'm not an optimistic person. I tend to be a pessimist by nature, but I do have to say what I have been seeing, some of it does make me slightly optimistic that perhaps now we are reaching that turning point. I don't make any predictions, so I'm not gonna predict that we have reached that turning point and that now there is gonna be a pushback, but for the first time, in quite a long time, I am very, very cautiously optimistic that perhaps that point has been reached. Great. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Clive? Yes, thanks very much, uh, Charles. Um, we don't spend much time in the book saying, you know, what should Western countries do in response? Um, a lot of the responses are kind of implied. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about new laws, such as Australia's foreign interference law, which is exceptionally important. Um, but in the end, I think the uh, pushback against CCP influence uh, in Canada, Australia, uh, United Kingdom, Germany, uh, United States, is fundamentally uh, a question for civil society. Laws uh, and administrations and uh, policing and intelligence, all of that is important, but in the end, it's civil society, it's going to be, you know, the people, if you like, that, uh, that carry out the pushback. And that depends fundamentally on shedding light on what the CCP is doing in Western nations, understanding what it's doing, and it's because the CCP loves operating in the shadows. And if you turn the light on, uh, then um, it makes it far more difficult for them to carry out their um, uh, coercive and covert activities. So really it requires uh, uh, citizens, uh, wherever they are, in their, in their workplaces, uh, in their universities, um, as political uh, agents, in their social clubs, uh, in, uh, wherever they are, understanding how the CCP operates and, uh, and to uh, expose and push back against it uh, wherever they are in their institutions. And just this very final point, which I think is exceptionally important, within, particularly within nations like Canada and Australia, where there are large uh, Chinese diasporas, uh, 
the mobilization of people of Chinese heritage uh, who live in the West because they love uh, living in democratic societies and enjoying the benefits of free speech and political participation. They are really our greatest asset in pushing back against the CCP. They are a tremendous resource for understanding United Front activity and its insidious effects. Uh, many of them live at, at a constant low level or in some cases high level fear of what the CCP might do to them if they do in, uh, exercise their political rights living in a democratic country. And we, uh, we are obligated uh, to support them, to back them, to protect their rights and to encourage them at every opportunity to be um, robust participants in the democratic debate in the free countries where they have chosen to live. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this brings our session to a close. I think everyone agrees that this book, Hidden Hand, makes an important contribution to, as Clive says, shedding light on what the Chinese Communist Party is up to in the West. Sunshine is the best disinfectant, and I think that we're seeing some clarity here. And certainly this book comes out at a very good time as public opinion and political pressure is increasing to try and, and come to terms with um, how we can best uh, engage with China in ways that are to the mutual benefit of both. The uh, book launch special details are in the YouTube video description at the bottom, and that includes the links for three options, a book and free ebook, discounted hard copy and a discounted ebook. I urge everyone to get their bid in early on and download that thing, uh, you know, before the lawsuits or whatever come up. Uh, I don't think uh, I don't think that's going to happen. And I'd like to thank particularly Alison Carrigan and Brett Byers for uh, putting this together, along with David Watson and our friends at the European Value Center for Security Policy, particularly uh, Jakob Yanda. And uh, thanks to everybody for uh, joining us today. And uh, I hope that we will be able to continue the discussion of these uh, very important issues at the MLI in the year ahead.